Northern Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are now in lesson number 152 in our series called Understanding the Jews. And tonight's lesson is entitled David and Absalom, part 10. So last week, we were able to get into one verse of 2 Samuel chapter 15. And in that verse, uh, we saw where David's newly reconciled son Absalom had not wasted any time laying the groundwork for his goal of taking the kingdom from his father. So let's reread just that one verse. And then we'll continue on from there. 2 Samuel 15 and verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. So without question, Absalom intended and surely was successful in getting himself noticed by the citizens of Jerusalem. The very high profile that he was looking for was now his. But as we were finishing up last week, we raised the question as to how Absalom would move on to the next step of his plan. Absalom now looks the part, but well, what's behind the curtain? What would be his policy? As king, how would he run the kingdom? Keeping in mind that as long as Absalom had been under that cloud of his questionable status with King David, uh, pertaining to that unresolved crime with his brother Amnon, Absalom really wasn't in any position to make a lot of waves. So up until now, people of Jerusalem really hadn't heard much from Absalom. And that had been the case for at least the previous five years. That's a long time. Now, he had been pardoned. He was more able to freely engage the populace and so Absalom took full advantage, set out to make sure that the people not only knew who he was, but what he would do. Every political pundit will tell you that name recognition is huge in any campaign. And make no mistake, well, King David may not have even been aware that he was in a campaign. Absalom's hat, on the other hand, was firmly in the ring. So now Absalom's going to begin that campaign, one that he hoped would offer the people a more desirable administration. So let's go to 2 Samuel now in the second verse in chapter 15. Scripture reads, And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. Absalom knew that it was important for the people to know him. And now we see that Absalom recognizes that it's also important that he knows them. He begins to ask everybody that he talks to where they are from. Again, any pollster would tell you that information such as that is quite valuable. By simply making that seemingly 
innocuous inquiry, Absalom is learning how much penetration his message is getting into each of the tribes of Israel. By the response of the people, the response that he's going to get to his policy positions, he could do some informal polling to ascertain his favorability among each of those tribes. And by keeping track as to how many people he has talked to in each tribe, he'd be able to figure out how long he would have to engage in those conversations at the gate before he would know when he had sufficient support to finally make a successful challenge to his father, David. So now we know why Absalom was at the gate. He was there to put forth his policy positions and to gauge how they were received amongst the general population. But what were those policy positions? What was it that Absalom had to offer? Well, for that, I want to go to the next passage in 2 Samuel 15. That would be verses 3 through 6. And the scripture reads, and Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, behold, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so, that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. This operation is priceless. Absalom is showing us a format that countless politicians and wannabes have employed and are going to employ forevermore, right down to the present time. Now, this passage that we're going through now may not necessarily be laid out chronologically, but rather by content. But after considering the totality of it, everything that we're going to learn here, we can easily get a pretty good picture, pretty accurate picture of the scene that's being laid out. Here we have this, as we described earlier, a dynamite looking guy, Absalom, sitting at the palace gate where the people are entering in, hoping to get a hearing of their case and they can well they would immediately realize that Absalom must be a man of considerable position they can see that he has this extraordinary entourage of horses and chariots and 50 men attending to him how could they not be impressed even if they didn't know who he was However, in short order, and probably almost right away, any potential litigant is either told or figures out, well, that this is the king's son. The next thing he knows, Absalom is calling out to him. He wants to know what tribe he's from. And then Absalom beckons for him to come over. Come. So the guy comes over, and as is customary, he begins to prostrate himself before the king's son, face to the ground. That would be the expected thing to do. But, before he can do so, Absalom reaches out and takes his hand, lifts him up, stops him. Oh, 
no. No need for that. I'm a man of the people. Let's talk, brother to brother. Now, before they even begin to talk about <clears throat> this man's case, you have to know that Absalom has just made that man feel pretty special. Here's the king's son. He's treating me like a total equal. That would be pretty heady stuff. So Absalom, he listens to the man's story with complete attention. However bogus his portrayed concern may have been. And while he's doing so, he's giving all the appropriate nodding of the head and understanding. And at the conclusion, Absalom would let the man know that he had an excellent case. That he was obviously in the right. Now we all know that in every case, there is an opposing side. We also know that no judge worth his salt would make a snap judgment and a subsequent ruling without even hearing the other side. Of course, it would also have been possible that over time, Absalom would have at different times heard both sides of the same case. Then you'd have to figure out some way to tell both men that they were both right. But in dealing with these people one at a time, Absalom would be able to show much sympathy for their cause. Then with much compassion, he would express his regret that unfortunately, they would be lucky if they even got a hearing much less a favorable verdict. And that was because King David could not possibly hear all of those cases by himself. And Absalom pointed out to them that, well, King David hadn't chosen any deputies to hear the excess of cases. Now it is also possible that David did in fact point, appoint some deputies, perhaps a few of his other sons, or maybe some other folks in the court. But the idea was that he had not appointed any fair deputies, i.e. ones who were in place were corrupt. They were not handing down good judgments. Whichever the case may have been, Absalom was probably not accusing David directly of being corrupt, but he was kind of vaguely laying some amount of dereliction of duty on him. And in any event, Absalom was surely pointing out a failed system of justice, a system that was responsible for many unfair verdicts, along with many unheard cases. The docket was clogged, and the people were frustrated in how long they had to wait. The bottom line is that Absalom was telling every litigant what he wanted to hear. They all had good cases and that his own personal efforts were completely in the public interest. He just wanted to fix the system. Of course, and that would have been to the benefit of everybody. And he left the thought in every man's mind, particularly those who had just lost his case, that if Absalom were king, things would have turned out differently. Instead of going home a loser, he could have gone home a winner. The old story, those out of office can promise anything. 
And that's just what Absalom was doing. Oh, and the people ate it up. Ate it up. Absalom became a rising star. Good looking, well spoken, charming, relatable, a man of the people. What's not the like? And as a result, it says at the end of verse 6 that Absalom stole the hearts of the people. And stole is the right word. He didn't win their hearts, fair and square. He stole their hearts through the use of lies and deceit and false promises. So how long did all this take? When was Absalom ready to make his move against King David? Let's go back to the scripture. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. Scripture reads, And it came to pass after forty years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. So now we are given a time stamp of sorts. The King James Version of the Bible says that Absalom requested to go to Hebron after 40 years. Okay, 40 years after what? Surely it wasn't 40 years after Absalom had started his campaign to win the people over in Jerusalem. That wouldn't appear to make any sense. One thing simple math of the situation doesn't add up. According to the scriptures, Absalom was born in Hebron after David had already to already began to reign as king. That would have been in Judah. And we know that David's total reign was a period combined of 40 years. So at the time we're considering in verse 7, Absalom could not have even reached the age of 40. Well, it looks like we have a situation. In Latin, well, we know the terminus ad chem, that would be whatever the date was in 2 Samuel 15, 7. But we don't know the terminus ad quo, the date of origin the starting point from which the 40 years would have been measured. What event is being referenced? Well, first of all, we can only get a ballpark figure for the actual year that Absalom's request to go to Hebron was made. Best evidence shows that he lived in, well, the 11th century BC. But nobody knows for sure the exact year of his rebellion. That being the case, it is not possible for us to subtract 40 years from an unknown date and discover the actual event that started the clock. The only thing that we can be sure of is the fact. Whatever that event was, it had to have taken place sometime during the reign of King Saul. And we know that there were a number of momentous events that occurred during his reign. But which one is being referred to here? Again, we just cannot know. Now, for full disclosure, some will say that the word 40 in verse 7 should instead read 4. 
after four years. Well, if you take that approach, you will have to accept the fact that there is an unaccounted for error in the scriptures that went uncorrected for a long time. And we do have today a split among many versions of the Bible between those who have made the change to four years and those who have retained 40. Seems to me that just because we don't know the terminus ad quo, the one that would fit this passage, that's not sufficient reason to change a word in the scriptures, even if it seems to make more sense at some level. In the instant case, you're making the, the example for a reduction in the time period to four years, you're still left with a fairly unlikely scenario. I would find it hard to believe. Absalom would have been camped out at the gate, at the palace gate, for four years, carrying on the way he was. Given the choice between the two, I believe that Absalom act, acting after 40 years, after a particular event, even given that the event may not be known, is preferable to changing the scripture to match up with a theory that appears to be just as unlikely, if not more so. Notwithstanding the fact that there are a few ancient manuscripts including one from our old friend Josephus, that do record four years in this verse instead of 40. That being the case, you are all free to embrace whichever version gives you the most confidence. And I'm saying that because I think I need to stop a little short of dogmatism. My opinion is just that. It's my opinion. Nothing more, nothing less. But here's one thing we can all agree on. 2 Samuel 15, 7 informs us that there did in fact come a time, a point in time, when Absalom believed that he had accomplished what he set out to do at the palace gate. He believed that he was now ready to make his move. And it's not critical that we know exactly how long that time period was. It just isn't. So next on his agenda was his belief that he needed to make a trip to Hebron. But why Hebron? Well, he hadn't spent all that time at the palace gate for nothing. By talking to countless people and ascertaining where they had come from, he came to understand that he had much support in Hebron. And Hebron makes a lot of sense. If you recall, when David first became king of Judah, he established Hebron as the capital city. And that is where he first reigned. But after he was successful in consolidating the kingdom and bringing in the northern tribes that had remained loyal to the house of Saul's son, Ishbosheth, he needed to make a change. David realized that picking a new capital was necessary. The country was not just Judah anymore. But it would be difficult to find a city that nobody would object to. Every tribe would have lobbied to have the capital as one of their own, the capital city. It would bring prestige, honor, commerce, and everything that goes with being the seat of power. 
But where could David put the capital? Where people would not get upset. Where nobody could complain about favoritism. Well, it turned out that David made a wise choice. The city of Jerusalem had been independent, an independent city since its very inception. The Jebusites who lived there were difficult to dislodge. In fact, Israel could never do it. That didn't happen until David himself finally defeated them and claimed the city for Israel. So, Jerusalem being a fairly new acquisition, really did not have any history with any particular tribe. There was no built-in pride attached to the city of Jerusalem like there would have been for any other city in the country. It was an anomaly. That being the case, it's a very shrewd selection on the part of David. Who could really complain? Jerusalem was as neutral a city as could be found at the time. Of course, David may have been proud of himself for that stroke of genius, but we know that God had long before selected Jerusalem as the capital. David was simply handed the right circumstances to make it happen. So, of all the cities in the newly reconciled nation, there was really only one single town that didn't like it. Hebron. And David moved his court out of Hebron for Jerusalem. Well, Hebron just became another town. They were used to being important. But now, they had clearly lost a lot of status. And with it, all the trappings that go with it. I'm sure that there were other reasons as well. But whatever they were, Absalom was aware of them. And he rightly identified Hebron as the place from which he could launch his insurrection. Not discounting the fact that it was indeed Hebron where his father David had first proclaimed or had been proclaimed king. How delicious would it be for Absalom himself to also be to made king, to be made king there. And to then also take Jerusalem from that very same power base. How sweet. But how does Absalom go about to get there? Absalom had long been pardoned. And he technically had his freedom. <clears throat> you could tell by the conversations he was having. But he must have realized his movements were still being monitored by King David as a sensible precaution. So he needed to have a good reason, a good excuse for making this trip to Hebron. But what did he do? Well, once again, he took a page out of his father David's book. which, by the way, was a recurring theme among his sons. You remember back one book in the book of 1 Samuel, there came a time when David was expected to be at a feast of the new moon at King Saul's palace. 
David devised a plan where his friend Jonathan would tell Saul that David had asked him to be excused so that he could return to the city of his birth, Bethlehem in that case, to make a sacrifice. Now the purpose of that plan was to find out if Saul had purposed any evil against David. Saul was okay with David making that trip, then David would know that Saul intended to have peace with him. But, if he got mad about David's absence, then David would know that Saul intended evil against him. So let's take a quick look at just enough of that account <clears throat> to refresh our memories. This will go back to 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 5 through 7. The scripture reads, And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked me, or asked leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he, if he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Now, in this example, David's request was not all that outlandish, not unreasonable. Those kinds of family gatherings did, in fact, happen. Now, Saul may have been a little put out, that David chose to spend the new moon with his old family instead of his new family. He had just recently married Saul's daughter, Michael. So it would have been a good test to see if Saul would react graciously, as one would expect under normal circumstances. Or, if he would expose his true feelings and get really mad about it. So in that case, Saul did get mad. Accordingly, David knew that Saul was more than just suspicious. David knew that he had to stay away from Saul. So the plan worked may not have been the result that David would have preferred, but it did reveal where David stood with Saul. And that information saved him from being killed at the hands of Saul. And now, the instant case with Absalom has a similar feel to it. Like his father before him, Absalom is requesting permission to return to the place of his birth, Hebron, to attend a religious obligation, just as David had done. The difference, of course, is that Absalom made his request in person, whereas David had asked his friend to do it. But because King David had thought that the underlying basis for his own previous request was valid and reasonable, Absalom knew that by him making a very similar request, his father should have viewed that request in the same manner. 
And of course, Absalom made his request all the more acceptable by telling David that it was the result of a vow that he had made unto God. A promise he had made that if God would be so kind as allow him to allow him to return to Jerusalem, i.e., to his father, well, he would perform a service to God in Hebron ostensibly some sort of sacrifice. And after too long of a delay, it was a vow that he now needed to make good on. Now I ask you, how could David deny such a heartwarming request? To think that while in Gesher, his son, had been praying to God to be reconciled to him to the point that he made a sacrificial vow obligating him to pay a certain service to the Lord. It's obvious that Absalom had really thought this through. He knew exactly what to say, exactly what would work on his father. After all, his father was his role model, and accordingly, Absalom's plan worked. David sent Absalom away to Hebron, and not only that, he sent him away with a blessing. He sent him away in peace. But it wasn't peace that Absalom had on his mind. It was war. And Lord willing, next week, we will begin to study how the clouds of war began to gather very quickly. We will also see that David's kind overtures to his son were not returned in like manner. Please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until next time, shalom.